Gracious master and friend, look on us now and come. Grant sight to the blind, for we would see Jesus. Amen. Last fall, Duke sent me off to Rome. And while there, I enrolled in a course on Renaissance and Baroque art. We'd walk every Friday to some church, set up, and have class right there. Caravaggio week came around, and I find myself ambling into the church of St. Louis of the French, a gorgeous, tall, open building filled with white marble, gold leaf, and light. At the back of the church, off to the left, in a shadowy little side chapel dedicated to St. Matthew, are three of the greatest paintings ever commissioned. Our teacher, Paul, led us there for our next lesson. Now, on the left of the chapel is one of Caravaggio's most well-known works, The Calling of St. Matthew. You've probably seen it, Jesus walking into a darkened room, pointing his hand at a well-dressed tax collector sat at the table named Matthew, who asks, Me? As a ray of light shines down upon him. Beautiful and famous for that. But I am part of Gen Z. I already knew that I was special, that I'm called. Of course God calls me. Why wouldn't he? I'm great. I've been inundated with propaganda to that effect my whole life. The scene is graceful, subtle, complex. But it didn't do much for me. Just opposite of the calling of St. Matthew, however, is a piece I'd never seen or heard of before. Staring directly across from the right side of the altar is the martyrdom of St. Matthew. Here, Caravaggio shows us what exactly Matthew was getting called to do. Die. Like all of Caravaggio's paintings, the martyrdom is shrouded in almost impenetrable darkness. But he shines a spotlight on just the right moment in time. It appears a soldier has rushed into a church right in the middle of the service. The crowd reels in shock. Matthew has fallen on the floor. And the soldier, this Herculean youth, catches the old man's arm to steady him for the blow of the sword. The altar is in the background where the apostle must have been standing just a moment ago saying his prayers in peace. But now Matthew lies on the edge of a chasm, dressed in black robes, as if he knew today would be his funeral. And with a peaceful demeanor, he t reaches up with the hand which the soldier is grasping to receive the martyr's palm from an angel. From the back, clothed in shadows, a face that looks like Jesus's, takes the spectacle in with affection. Now I'm an Anglican, and we don't do emotion. But then and there, the string holding me up snapped in half. I fell to my knees, crying. It was weird. My professor and classmates looked at me like I was crazy and moved on to the next side chapel. A throng of Italian high schoolers crowding around were too busy chattering and seducing each other to notice me. But all of a sudden, my heart was quiet and I felt a burden lift. Looking at that 420 year old painting did something to me. It moved my heart. Across 20 centuries, Matthew the Apostle, the blood of martyrdom still fresh on his breath, reached out to me and whispered, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Today, John tells us in our gospel that some Greeks wanted to get a good look at Jesus. They wanted to see this wandering preacher for themselves. Still, they weren't sure if they could. They didn't speak Aramaic, and over the past few years, Jesus has refused to go after Gentiles. 
According to him, it was not yet his hour. But now a gaggle of Greeks asks to see him, and his hour is here. Jesus lets them know real quick how it's going to go. You think that what it means to be God is to rule the cosmos with an iron fist, throwing lightning bolts and smiting sinners. You think that when you see God descending on the clouds, he'll be rich, he'll be clean and well-fed and well-spoken, and he'll look like you. You think that when God comes, you'll recognize him. But you're wrong. When God comes, he is a poor Jew from Nazareth with a hick accent. When God comes, he's down in the ditch with us. When God comes, he knows our grief. He knows the pain of a relative's passing. He experiences that cavernous ache for a friend taken too soon. He feels the state's mighty knee on his almighty neck. He is lifted up from the earth on a Roman cross. Jesus warns these Greeks ahead of time. When God comes, you will not see him, even when he is right in front of your face. A great deal of ancient religious practice, as these Greek men would have experienced it, was animated by their longing to see God, to have a genuine vision of the divine. Pagan temple worship revolved around the image of the deity. The statue of the god or goddess sat in his or her shrine, and the great doors were opened so that the people might steal a peek through the columns and through the smoke so that they might catch a glimpse of their God. On the other hand, Yahweh let the Israelites know that they were not able to see him, whether in image or for real. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai, he could only see God's backside pass him by, and only when he was hidden safe in the cleft of the rock. And even then, when Moses came down to the people, he had to cover his face to protect them, lest they die after coming into contact with just the residue of God's glory. In the Old Testament, the prophets urge continually, Behold, look, see. But the Israelites could only hear God. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord is one. But now, at long last, in Christ, God gives us a glimpse of himself. Now, God can be seen face to face with a poor Jewish baby in a feeding trough. In a hungry, homeless, wandering preacher. In a man on a tree. God's greatest work of art. No need for blinders because he is the one who gives sight to the blind. God himself walked in Galilee, healing the sick and forgiving sins. And we saw him. Jesus both preserved and overturned the hopes and fears of ancient believers yearning for a vision of God's face. God gave us a picture of himself, yes, but he gave us a glimpse only visible in the face of a crucified peasant. And so in the face of every neighbor that demands our love. Isaiah says that Jesus had no beauty that we should behold him. But perhaps that's exactly why we can't look away His face might not have been proportional. He didn't quite fit into the golden ratio. He may be a god, but he's no Apollo. Still, I wonder what untold knowledge is whispered in just the slope of his nose. 
what supernal wisdom hides in the way his bushy eyebrows almost meet. What everlasting sigh of love is sung by the bend of his cupid's bow. What bosom cry of the spirit breathed forth from before all worlds is proclaimed in the way his frail arms unfold to embrace the hard wood of the tree. And the way his hands seem made just for those nails. The way they welcome as an honored guest the blunt force of the soldier's hammer. Those eyes, those precious eyes, the eyes which, which God sees the world the eyes which moved Hagar to cry in the desert, you are the God who sees me. May God grant us the eyes to see him there, hanging on the tree. For that is Jesus' glory, demonstrating his love for us, willingly giving over his life. He shows us who he is. Jesus' suffering on Good Friday was not some temporary weakness on God's part that he cancels out with Easter. The cross so shows us something permanent about God, that the eternal power of God is love, and that this expressed in history must be suffering, that the resurrected self is always also the crucified self. When the God who is love lives with us, lives in us, it hurts. God showed what it meant to be God, not by being almighty, throwing thunderbolts and smiting sinners, but in the all too human act of dying. That is the manner in which God the Father, speaking for the last time here in the Gospel of John, declares, I have glorified my name, and I will glorify it again. And God continues to glorify his name today. Amazonian villages and forests undone by rapacious colonizing greed. Yazidi blood congealing in the sand. Unborn children who will never breathe the sweet morning air. Asian Americans daily facing abuse and violence. Children still in cages, knees on necks. The trauma and disappointment of your life and mine, all on constant, vivid display. At the same time, we live in a pornographic age, constantly inundated by bright colors and pretty faces but we are unable to see real beauty. We all behold ugliness. But, but, like Caravaggio, resting light out of the darkness, God makes a way out of no way. He works all things together for good for those who love him, for all those he calls according to his purpose. The deep, Caverns of our souls where pain lives can also become, through Christ, pools of light where the glory of God can be reflected. At the same time that Jesus' death is a moment of despair, it's a moment of resurrection. It's the hour of God's glory, of him being lifted up when his love for the world is fully revealed. Brothers and sisters, if we don't see him there, lifted up on the cross, we won't ever really see him at all. Because that is where he shows us most truly who he is. Looking at this God, this man, seeing him lifted up on the cross changes our hearts as Jeremiah hopes for in our first reading. The sight is so wonderful that it leaves an impression on our hearts. 
we don't realize how dead and dying we are till at last we see his vibrancy. We can't go away the same as we came. Jesus shows us that to have God's law written on our hearts means to realize that my being increases exactly in the measure that I give it away. That I must give away my life and so live my whole life as a gift. The truly strong can rejoice in their weakness. Even if we can't see it, this Jesus on the cross, this lamb standing as though slain, he is the king of the world. With this man as our king, we are those who do not harden our hearts to the pain and need of others, who do not give evil entry into our souls, but suffer under it. We constantly reposition the center of our gravity from I to us. Jesus moves our hands to open the windows of the world to let the light in. We, even we Duke students, have no obligation to join the world in its rat race. We don't have to be controlled by the fear of death and loss, by the desire for pleasure and protection, by the reactive and violent dynamics of flesh. I don't know what that means for you, but you might. And if you don't, pray. God is self-giving love, bloody love. To live as a follower of Jesus is to live in self-giving love, to die to self, to see God's image in others and so to become ourselves an image of God. This is something that we work out with fear and trembling. And it's not until our final breath that we truly grow up into the image of God when at last we give ourselves in total. Then God completes his work in us. If we have lived our lives dying, physical death will be our first moment filled only with life. Then God will give us a glimpse of himself. Then we will look on him whom we have pierced. And then we will see him as he is. In the name of the God who gives us eyes to see, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.